Hi, my name is Lucas Karstensen, and I'm a PhD student in the Hasselmo Lab in the Center for Systems Neuroscience at Boston University. The work I'll be showing you today is about the neural correlates of environmental alterations in retrosplenial cortex and high-resolution tracking of behavior using infrared cameras. For some background, retrosplenial has been shown to be important for tracking distance between landmarks, for contextual memory, and for orienting oneself in an environment. In work by Marchette et al., they trained participants to become familiar with an environment and learn the layout of different objects and landmarks and imagine facing the direction of one of those objects at different locations in the environment. They showed retrosplenial cortex had higher pattern similarity between views that face the same direction when participants were imagining themselves facing a direction in which they knew a landmark to be versus different local directions. For example, there would be more similarity between someone standing at seven facing eight and standing at four facing three, rather than standing at four facing seven. So there would be more similarity when both were directions were facing north than when one was facing north and the other facing west. Retrosplenial cortex is also shown to be important for navigation in rodents and contains many head direction cells, which respond when the animal is facing a certain direction, with some examples shown here on the right, such as the middle cell firing when the animal is facing north. Retrosplenial cortex neurons have also been shown to have firing representing different aspects of the environment, such as the boundaries of the arena that arise navigating. In previous work from our lab, we showed that retrosplenial cortex cells respond when there is a boundary at a specific distance and direction from the animal, which we termed egocentric boundary cells, with this top example showing a higher firing when there is a boundary on the animal's left and close to its body. Because of this evidence that shows retrosplenial cortex is important for orienting within an environment as well as contextual memory, we designed a task in which we could manipulate different landmarks and aspects of the environment. For our task, we had rats forage for scattered rewards in a 1.25 meter square arena with observable fixed distal cues for a minimum duration of 12 minutes and 45 seconds. Then they were returned to their home cage for at least an hour. For the second session, we returned the rat to the same arena to forage, but an object consisting of a small tower of Lego bricks was introduced to the environment after the first baseline session. The object was not novel to the animal, and the rat was not rewarded for interacting with the object. After foraging for the same amount of time, the rat was then returned to its home cage and the object was removed from the arena. For the last session, the rat was returned to the arena that did not contain an object and allowed to forage in an identical manner to the first session. The most striking neurophysiological phenotype reflecting object insertions was an apparent alteration to overall firing rate. The mean firing rate was significantly and systematically modulated as a function of the presence or absence of an object in about 20% of neurons recorded in all of the three sessions. In about 60% of the neurons, the mean firing rate significantly increased in the object session compared to the pre and post object sessions, with three examples shown here on the left. On the right, I broke down each session into 10 bins and calculated the mean firing rate for each bin so you could see how the mean firing rate changes across the session. The session. In about 40% of these neurons, the mean firing rate significantly decreased in the object session compared to the pre and post object sessions, with examples again shown on the left and the session breakdown shown on the right. Because of our past work showing that a large proportion of retrosplenial neurons are modulated by speed, we next determined which cells were speed sensitive in any one of the three sessions to determine if this influenced in the change in mean firing rate. Only about a third of all cells that significantly changed mean firing rate in the object session had significant speed tuning. However, more than three quarters of the cells in the overall population showed significant speed tuning in at least one session. This led us to conclude that mean firing rate alterations were not driven by systematic changes in linear speed tuning between sessions. To break the speed modulation down further, we show that there are differ differing speed tuning preferences in the cells that are speed modulated. 
cells showed a broad range of tuning to different speeds as shown on the left of the figure here. Next, we qualitatively separated these tuning curves into three categories with example speed tuning curves for each session shown on the right, which are decreasing or having a speed tuning curve that shows highest speed modulation at low speeds, preferred or showing a firing rate that reaches a maximum at a specific preferred speed range, and increasing, which show increasing speed modulation as speed increases. When we recorded in the object manipulations, the arena remained in a fixed location relative to the experimental room and distal cues. In a separate set of manipulations, we also found similar changes in mean firing rate when we changed the relationship between the familiar arena and the testing room. This allowed us to determine the effects on mean firing rate changes, the current configuration of the boundaries of the arena, and their relationship to the distal cues. In the first manipulation, the orientation of the environment with respect to the distal cues of the room was changed. In the ma manipulation session, we rotated the open field 45 degrees to disrupt correspondence between the arena walls and the distal walls or cues present within the recording environment from the post and pre-manipulation sessions. This allowed us to study mean firing rate changes that occurred due to changes in the relationship between the boundaries of the local arena and the cues and boundaries of the broader record recording room. In this condition, we found about 16% of cells exhibited a mean firing rate change, with most of the neurons increasing in mean firing rate rather than decreasing in the rotation session. To further examine whether differences in the environment sh shape could produce a change in mean firing rate, we next manipulated the dimensions or geometry of this experimental arena. We either expanded the arena or the recording was performed in a circular arena in the middle session. The mean firing rate significantly changed in about 25% of neurons recorded in all three sessions and the cells were split 50-50 in increasing or decreasing firing rate. For the last manipulation I'm showing here, we wanted to determine the effect of the presence of visual boundaries on the mean firing rate, so we removed the walls of the arena in the middle session. In the no walls manipulation, about 27% of cells showed a significant increase in mean firing rate with none decreasing their mean firing rate, and egocentric boundary cells were excluded from this analysis. Together, we show these systematic changes in mean firing rate demonstrate a signal of an alteration of the local environment or the relationship between the local and distal features of the environment. In collaboration with Margaret Betke's Computer Vision Lab at BU, we started recording our animals using higher resolution infrared cameras from multiple perspectives with a goal of more in-depth behavioral tracking and analysis. This allows us to record in complete darkness and maintain very high resolution. Recording with these cameras from multiple points of view allows us to be able to reconstruct the three-dimensional pose of the animal and use that to inform more sophisticated behavioral analyses, whereas many spatial navigation experiments mainly use head direction, body direction, or spatial location to find just one point. For example, we can use the entire pose of the animal to determine if it's rearing, grooming, turning, or some other behavior, as well as use it to inform analyses while recording neural data. I'd like to thank everyone in the Hasselmo lab, especially Mike Hasselmo, Andy Alexander, Bill Chapman, and John Yule Lee, who helped me with the experiments, analyses, and the writing of the manuscript with all of this data. I'd also like to thank our collaborators in the Becky lab for providing the cameras and doing the work regarding the 3D pose reconstruction of the rats. I'd also like to thank the Graduate Program for Neuroscience at BU and our funding sources at the NIH and the Office of Naval Research. Thank you for watching my presentation and reach out to me by email or Twitter or stop by during my poster discussion time slot if you have any questions. Thanks.